Hello everyone. For this edition of Meet the Lindens, I'd like to introduce two rather important Lindens. Philip Linden, who as Philip Rosedale in real life founded Linden Lab, the parent company of Second Life, which is of course an open-ended internet connected virtual world and a pioneering metaverse one where the base was built and the tools supplied allowing people to create their own avatars their own environments their own second lives as we see all around us here at the birthday and I'm also joined by Oberwolf Linden, who in real life is Brad Oberweger, the executive chairman of Linden Lab, who spent his entire career in technology and consumer focused companies as an entrepreneur and board member. Currently, he sits on the board of two public companies, Assure Software. NASDAQ as Azure and Better World, NASDAQ BWACU. He's the chairman of two companies he founded, Jive and Sundia, and is also on the board of TEGSCO. I'm not sure whether I pronounce that as an acronym, TEGSCO, uh, also yes. known as Auto Return and he owned Bear Snacks, acquired by PepsiCo in 2018. Bear Snacks, and it's B-A-R-E, by the way, for what, 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 what were Bear Snacks? Asking me, sorry? Yes, yes. Well, thanks, that, uh, thanks. Um, so Bear Snacks, uh, that was a company that made apple chips and coconut chips. And the whole point of Bear Snacks were they were single ingredient um, snack foods. So the apple chips only had apples. We wanted to figure out a way to not have any oil or fat or bad things um, mm -hmm. in the product. And so we developed a 400 yard oven um, that could make an apple chip taste just like it, uh, if it was uh, fried and right. it was crispy and wonderful. So it was a fun company to have. It sounds it. Is it still going under Pepsi? Yes, they were very clever in taking our product, which was an organic and wonderful, thoughtful product and turning it into a non-organic um, <laughs> product that you can make much less expensively. Um, and. Uh, um, but it's uh, still in all the airports and Starbucks and Safeways and things like that. It's always nice to see things that you poured your heart and soul into become successful, even if you don't own them. Yeah. Now, you were also vice chair of YPO International, a global organization of 25,000 CEOs, I believe. Yes. So. Um, as Philip will attest to, um, being the CEO of a company is rather a lonely um, job. Uh, whenever things are happening, I mean, first of all, it's super fun because of the camaraderie that you build. Um, and then uh, um, for those of us dealing with our demons, it's a wonderful thing to, you know, pour your pour your energy into and, and try to try to change the world. But when things go wrong or when you have fears and when you have um, those moments of doubt, there's actually not a lot of people that you can turn to. Um, mm -hmm. And running a company, um, things go wrong. And so, you know, Philip, I know he, he's had these things, but you have these investors and they're your board and you think they're there for you. And they really are. But that doesn't mean that you want to share everything with them. And so this organization came about to help young CEOs who really didn't have anywhere to turn. And we all get together with other young CEOs. And um, it became quite an organization. And you really learn how to just look inside yourself and say, I don't have all the answers. Um, and you get in these small groups where everybody just wants the best for everybody else. 
Uh, and I really, it really changed my life. And so I wanted to give back to that organization and the way to do it was to get into leadership. And, you know, I ran the West coast and then the, this and that, and then the international board. And I made some of my closest friends and, and in fact, um, and then became vice chairman. And in fact, the chairman of all of YPO, uh, was Randy Waterfield. And so he and I were super close and he's the person that I own Linden with. So we actually became friends through YPO. And then when the opportunity to be involved with Lyndon came up, um, he and I uh, partnered up on it. That's great. Now, Philip, I'd like to start by asking you, what about the residents and what they've created in Second Life has been most exciting for you? Mm. Well, you know, usually if you ask me that question, I would say something about art. I would, <clears throat> I would say something about like the, the, the Sims that I've been to and the places that I've seen that are the most um, remarkable, you know, and, and, and sort of, I think one of the things that was so amazing about Second Life as it grew was that, you know, you, because people were working together and collaborating and challenging each other, you got this kind of escalation of artwork that was eventually kind of beyond anything anyone could imagine and i and i still feel that way about second life so like my most amazing moments are often like getting sent a link or you know going into an artistic work and then just being immersed in it and blown away by it but right now especially where the world is uh you know where, where we all all the problems that we're facing with technology and with the world the thing that i like the most about second life is is how it remains how it is and how it has remained a kind of a sign of hope um in the way that people are able to come together and form community and communicate with each other in a civil, productive, you know, boundary crossing in a good way, kind of a way. So I, I look at Second Life with, you know, the, the million people that are here getting along and in fact, you know, telling me stories about how they, you know, resolved differences or met somebody that they wouldn't have thought they'd like in the real world or something. And then, you know, liked them or fell in love with them even as an avatar. That That I think is the thing that, I'm happiest about right now because of, you know, how much we need that and how important it is that we figure out how to get the, maybe, you know, maybe get some of the great ideas out of Second Life and get them into, you know, into the world as broadly as we can. And Oberwolf, it's been something over a year since you joined Linden Lab. Have you been able to spend much time in Second Life? You, you seem to have a very busy life anyway. Well, um, probably not as much as uh, as I should. I, but first of all, I spend a tremendous amount of my time on Second Life. Um, mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is I'm thinking about it 24 hours a day because um, it's what I do. And I spend uh, 100 times more time on at Linden than I do on everything else I do combined. Um, so Second Life is something that I think about all the time and do everything I can to provide the resources to make it better for the residents um, and help the organization. But the more specific answer is, no, I don't spend that much time in world. Um, and I don't have a, a you know, I don't have a, a, an answer other than that. Right. Maybe you'll be able to spend a bit of time at the birthday and find yes. some things that you might like to do, like yes. playing golf or surfing. Well, if I enjoy golf in Second Life, that would be that would be <laughs> quite the experience because I don't I enjoy it at all that. in my physical <laughs> life, <laughs> yeah. in the physical world. It's not my, getting, not my thing. <laughs> getting Brad into golf would be a tall order. <laughs> <laughs> well, we and me too, surfing. and me too, by the way. I don't, I don't say that with a knowing <laughs> voice. So, Philip, prior to Linden Lab, uh, you created an innovative internet video conferencing product, Freeview, which was later acquired by Real Networks, where you went on to become vice president and CTO. Then following Second Life, you worked on several projects related to distributed work and computing, and then you re-entered the virtual world space in 2013, co-founding High Fidelity, which was a company 
devoted to exploring the future of next generation shared virtual reality. Can you tell me what drew you back to virtual reality? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, even going back to what you said about Freeview, one of the things that's always kept me working and, you know, programming, uh, you know, and, and being involved in technology has been my passionate desire to like get people say across the world from each other that don't know each other to communicate online in a, in as real a way as possible. You know, the first thing I did, as you said, Freeview was video conferencing, but it was video conferencing in 1995, which if you know the internet, you know, there wasn't yeah. very much in the way of video conferencing in 1995. So it was a pretty mm -hmm. early radical idea, but, you know, being able to see these tiny little black and white videos of people halfway across the world was moving, you know, incredibly moving to me. And then mm -hmm. with Second Life, obviously, you know, we moved the ball so much farther forward. With High Fidelity, you're right. What 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 got me back into it was that the chip, the, the, the foundational story of High Fidelity is fun. We were working on something else. We were working on this thing called Coffee and Power, which was which was also a ton of fun. There was about 10 of us. And I bought the tiny little chip called a gyro chip that is in all our phones today and also is the key thing that's in the oculus uh you know quest in the oculus rift right and i i put one i i powered up one of those things this is a little chip that you could hold you know between your thumb and forefinger which is what i was doing and then i looked at an oscilloscope where i could see the voltage change as i turned that chip right as i basically right. moved it the way one's head would move wearing an oculus rift that was to come some years later and just looking at the chip i knew that oculus was going to happen i knew that that little chip meant that somebody would be able to build a head mounted display and so and i think i was wrong about this by the way at the time um and, and you know i thought that that chip would mean that VR and virtual worlds was gonna take a giant step forward very quickly. And our avatars that we see today here would be able to move naturally like we do, you know, and would be able to communicate with each other. And so I started High Fidelity because I made a bet that the head-mounted display would change, would change everything and would change the world. And where we are now, uh, my gosh, I can't believe it, but almost 10 years later than when I started High Fidelity, is that those devices have not changed the world yet as much as they could. And in particular, they're not yet effective for getting people to communicate with each other, which was the thing I was so passionate about. So that's what got me into it. And, you know, it's also kind of what brings us to where we are uh, now, you know, which is it's it's a hard problem. You know, we, we haven't been able to connect people um, you know, so much as I'd ultimately like to see. It's surprising, though. Um, I was shown a project that's being used for training maternity nurses in um, Kenya. And they're doing it through virtual reality, working through phones. And they strap the phones on and they go through that. Wow, that's yeah. great. I do think, by the way, that there are specific vertical use cases for head-mounted displays that they are mm -hmm. going to be significant in. And and if you ask me, and and again, that, that you know, Brad and I were just talking about this the other day. Um, if you asked me for a vertical that was both something Second Life has been successful in, and also something that you know I think VR goggles will at some point kind of head the way in, I I would say it's education. I, I, just as mm -hmm. you say, I, I think it's. Uh, being able to bring teachers and students together from across the world in VR and, or in virtual worlds, I think is something that is not here yet. And there are some big problems still to getting to it, but I think it will happen. And there are things like medical simulation, as you're saying today, that really do show the promise there. Yeah. So, Wolf, what? Sorry, can I call you Wolf? Do I call you Oba Wolf or Wolf? Well, or... I think... Only, only, uh, I only because there's someone at the company whose name is Wolf. Um, do I, I go by Overwolf for for that reason? So, but you can call me whatever you'd like. <laughs> I answer to all sorts of things. I 
leave the experimentation with that perhaps for a later date. <laughs> but um, what I wanted to ask was what led you to Second Life? I mean, clearly you're passionate about the concept and, and the lab and the work of the lab. What led you to it? Well, first of all, Philip and I have known each other for over a decade. Um, and so I've known about Second Life for quite some time. Um, and Philip and I, we, we live three blocks away from each other. Um, and we see each other quite regularly. We're very close friends. Um, and so there was just a, a part of it that just became some of the, I mean, it's, it's some of the lore and the myth of Philip Rosedale. And to be close to it, um, it was, was just uh, intriguing. Now, Philip and I also go to Burning Man together every year. And when I, when I say go together, we, 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 he's been many, many, many more times than me, but um, for the past, for the past, uh, I don't know, better part of seven or seven or so years, we drive up together in his RV um, and get to spend that time. And so um, during that time, it's it's great time to reflect because you're separate from your um, from your daily life in a way. And Philip was um, a shareholder of Linden, but not actively part of the company like uh, at, at a level that he is now and, and previous and the company had investors and investors run companies in certain ways and one of the things that this type of investor had was they were venture capitalists and venture capitalists have time horizons on their investments and so the venture capitalists wanted to um, uh, sell linden uh, because their funds were over and they had to give money to their to their investors and, and things like that. Mm. But Linden is a very interesting company because one of the things that makes Second Life so incredible and so cutting edge, if you will, is that decisions that Philip made years and years ago that set Second Life apart, also um, built a couple things. And so let me tell you about them because it's, it's a lot of where my passion came from. So as you mentioned in the beginning, what Second Life is at its core is a social experiment, if you will. Let's build, let's give people the opportunity to build things and see what happens. And then they ended up becoming friends and, and creating uh, these wonderful, um, relationships. It's also a technology uh, platform that allows people in the most simplest way to build things um, and, and have commerce. And when, you, when, when I think about, when I look at sort of what the relationship between the social and the commerce is, is that the social brings us together by, by allowing commerce, people are able to um, <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, people are able to um, specialize in certain things and just like in the physical world in societies, produce things and, and for sale and it makes the whole world better. Um, and when you do that, creators, if you will, before they were even called creators, built things and money moved. And when money moves, when someone buys a Linden dollar, and then buys something with that Linden dollar and the creator has the Linden dollar. Now the creator may wanna take that Linden dollar and put it into fiat, a dollar bill or a bank account so they can buy a cup of coffee. That creates this very interesting thing, which is it's called money transmission. And money transmission is regulated um, uh, in many parts of the world. And so <laughs> Second Life, Linden, actually built an entire licensed, legal, audited, incredibly um, sophisticated money system to support Second Life. And yes. they built that over time. And without it, you can't have creators take money out of the system. It's fascinating. The challenge with it is it's extraordinarily regulated by the states, by different governments, by different countries. 
And so now let's say you're going to buy Linden. You can't buy one without the other. They work in tandem. But the buyer is completely different. The buyer of Second Life is someone who understands games and worlds and technologies. And the buyer of Tilia is someone who understands finance and regulation and audits. And there's not many people out there that can do both. And so a lot of the deals um, fell apart. And we were in, in the RV to bring this all around. We were in the RV and the deal that was on the table and I had been listening for a year. Every year there was a different deal and every year it fell apart through no fault of Phillips. And I said, if this one falls apart, I'm going to buy it. Um, and I said it, you know, jokingly. Um, and then Philip called and said, hey, I think this one's falling apart. Do you, <laughs> and I knew one of the board members and I called him and, and Philip introduced, but I had known him from a previous deal. And they said, yeah, and we just want to sell it. And I said, well, how about I buy it? Now, I had no money to do that. Um, and so if you remember, I was good friends with this gentleman, Randy, and he knows the fintech side. He knows finance better than anyone else. And right. so he has owned banks and, and things. And so he got interested and I told him, this is going to be the best thing we've ever done. It's going to be the most fun. And so he said, okay. And so he figured out the money side. Um, I worked with the VCs and the team and we kind of, it just sort of happened. And that's, that's the story. That's the true story. That's wonderful. It's been a, a year and a half after the acquisition now. So how's it going, do you think? Is it still as exciting as when you were in the RV and planning it? In many ways, it's more exciting. And, and I can only answer half. So I can only answer from my view how it's going. But the real question, and what, and, and so, and let me give some background. So when you buy a company, there's only a few ways that you can create more value, um, mm -hmm. if you will. And let's, let's just for the sake of it, for right now, because it's not the only type of value, but just let's talk about monetary value. And there's all these different dynamics, but in general, you can increase revenues and keep expenses the same. You can keep revenues the same and decrease expenses. Or you can grow revenue and expenses and hope that the differential is bigger than flat, right? Mm. And it's the third that's actually the most difficult, but also the most interesting. So what I've noticed is the more we put into Second Life, the more um, engagement we get, the better things go. Running a metaverse, running a virtual world, running Second Life in particular is not an inexpensive thing. And so if you do something like move to AWS, which helps people tremendously, or we're looking at things, we're looking at new technologies and new ways to make the world better for the residents, that has to equate to some sort of monetary return, not because of greed but because of not going out of business, right? So if we do mobile and we build a mobile app, you don't just snap your fingers and build a mobile app. You have to build it and it can cost millions of dollars. And we want to do that for the residents. The, the business side means we have to see some, and it can be five years down the road, but we have to see some return on that. So the most exciting thing that I've seen in, in terms of owning Linden is that when you invest in the residents and when you invest in things, the residents are happier and so is my CFO. When we invest <laughs> in things, we don't lose money. We lose money for a little while, but ultimately yeah. the residents see the value and what we, what we spend a lot of time on and the mantra in the company is, we don't charge for the same thing. Our goal is to give $2 worth of value and charge a dollar for it. Because right. hopefully the $2 worth of value only costs us 90 cents to build. And that's my model is spend 90 cents, but give you $2 worth of value, charge a dollar, and we're all happy. You know, listening to you talk about this, I'm thinking, of the creation of the the big Linden homes 
um, project and on the island of Belisaria, well, the, the continent of Belisaria, and the way that residents have absolutely rushed in and they're so excited when new themes come out and people move there and they've they've created sub communities um, there's a board of bureaucracy that issues passports to people there's mermaid colonies there's horse riding trails with people meeting up regularly to go horse riding just from the build of these houses that people got if they had premium membership and it's it, it's like uh, as you were saying you know they they are getting so much value out of it it's it's financial value but there's also social capital for the rest exactly as well. and it's a perfect example we don't make money we, we lose money on that but it creates so much goodwill and so much positive interaction that eventually it will work its way out. Um, and so hopefully the residents have seen more of that than they have in the past, more investment in making their experience better. And then what we will do is we will offer in the future different levels of what you can pay for in terms of your experience. So we're gonna give more to the, um, to the premium subscriber because as things become less expensive for us, we can give more, but we're also mm -hmm. gonna come out with a higher level of premium where we offer even more because you, if, if premium mm -hmm. is 9.99 or, and we, we had to move the price up for various tax reasons, but if premium is nine dollars, nine ninety nine, and it costs us eight ninety nine to run it, we want to give fifteen dollars worth of value, but we can't. So yeah. the way to do that is to come up with a nineteen ninety nine uh, service, and then those people who really will value that extra eight ninety nine, that that additional nine dollars, we have an opportunity to give it to them because right now we don't have a way to give $18 a month worth of value because we have no way to charge $18 a month. So mm -hmm. when you see things like that, it really is all about providing more value to the residents. And keep in mind, I, I, I'm not trying to come across as altruistic. It, it is a business, but we're yeah. constantly trying to figure out ways to find that sweet spot where we offer more value where we can charge less for the value that we provide and when you can find that it really is i i, I shy away from win-win it really is a way to make the pie bigger and and i think we all benefit from that and 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 i think anybody that you talk to in the company outside of me will reinforce um will reinforce uh that that's the way we run the company Philip, do you want to add anything to that? No, I mean I think that's great. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think it's I think it's great. I think as Brad said, I mean that, that was that was a lot. That Brad was just saying. I mean the the second life has always been a magical thing. It 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 hasn't. It has broken a lot of the rules of kind of late stage capitalism. I think, and. Mm you know, Brad and, and, and Randy coming in to, uh, you know, take, take over the company from the venture, you know, from the more traditional kind of, you know, venture capital model is, is just, you know, yet another example of us kind of, I think, thinking differently. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, uh, it, it is a constant and ongoing, uh, challenge and fun and inspiration to try and, you know, keep doing the things in Second Life that the people want. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a wonderful yes, challenge. They want so many things. I know. I know. Brad. I know. Brad came in at some point and he said, "I, I don't remember. It was like after his, <laughs> it was like after his second, second or third week or something." And mm. I don't remember exactly what he said, but he's just like, you know, my God, it's full of stars. You know, he had like <laughs> gone to a few <laughs> meetings, and you know, 
been told, you know, been told about the complexity of the thing. And I know Brad, he actually loves that, you know, because he's just, he's just super, super smart and he loves a good challenge and he loves thinking about complex stuff. And he's just like, this is unbelievable. You know, I knew it would be crazy, but I never knew it would be crazy <laughs> like this. <laughs> I was going to add one further thing. You know that there's a version of Burning Man in Second Life, do you? The very first version of Burning Man in Second Life was hosted out by, by Michael and Dusty at a party that was being had at my house. So it was basically ah. kind of like a Burning Man-ish party at my house while the two people, one of whom was one of the founders of Burning Man, were running the Burning Life experience from my house from my party at my house so how's that wow. for that's you know, very go cool. back in time from all the indirection there yes yes let's turn a little um to talking about the metaverse because we're seeing a huge resurgent of interest in the metaverse and i know that you're both interested in the new forms it's taking so how is Second Life responding to the new wave of interest in virtual worlds and the metaverse? And how would you say our vision, Second Life vision, is different from that of uh, Meta, Mark Zuckerberg? Well, obviously, I could talk in, uninterrupted about that for an hour or 90 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever your convenient time is um i i you know the metaverse word came out of snow crash written 1992 as as perhaps i talked about here before my wife yvette brought me snow crash uh or got it for my birthday in 92 and, and basically said here is some science fiction about that thing you're always talking about you know because by then i was already uh, completely obsessed, uh, you know, with this idea of building a virtual world. So, you know, the, certainly the word goes all the way back, but you're right. The, 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 at this sudden moment, you know, 2000 to 2000, you know, 2020 to 2022, we've got this resurgence of interest in metaverse. It's really come from three things, in my opinion. Um, one is obviously COVID and the idea that we'd all have to spend more time inside and less time doing social things than, we historically did. And then I think the other one was Facebook kind of throwing this giant weird Hail Mary and claiming that they created and owned the entire name and space. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the third one is all the kind of chitter chat around crypto and Web3 and stuff, which, you know, by the way, you know, whether you're talking about NFTs or um, as Brad was talking about earlier about like, you know, basically creating a fluid economy, many of the ideas that have driven the kind of some of the the way people think about crypto today are things that were richly explored uh, and or you know done or deployed in second life from the very beginning. So yeah, it's all kind of come back together. I, I do think though, I, I guess one thing I'd open with and then you know toss it to Brad, the the concept of the metaverse from second life was that of enabling people to make things together in a single space, which was very much mm -hmm. my inspiration. And that, for example, you needed a you needed an economy for that, but you didn't need an economy because you wanted to speculate on a coin going up. You needed an economy because people needed to be able to barter. They, they needed to be able to engage in trade. And those people were typically not in the same country. So there was no Venmo or something that they could use, right? So out of practicality and out of the desire to enable people to come together and make things, we had to build all that stuff. I would note that a lot of the enthusiasm around the metaverse today, unfortunately, is in that different direction of exploiting and surveilling people so that you can sell them things, mm -hmm. um, which is a very different sort of an idea than Second Life is based on. So my hope is that we, my hope is that Second Life can serve both for itself and you know perhaps for the industry more broadly as this example of what the metaverse could be, or maybe one of the things that it could be uh, with the hope that we all kind of go more in that direction. But I, I do worry that the resurgence of interest in the term is different from Second Life in its focus on this idea of, you know, finding yet more ways to sort of 
exploit people and extract money from them for you know small transactions or 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 advertisements or whatever yes Brad. It's Brad, when, but you got to yeah well it, when you when you asked the question and you said uh, it, it was very interesting the thoughts that popped into my head when you said um given all this new stuff what's been the impact on second life and interestingly the answer is none um none <laughs> impact um second life is uh is its own place and whether mark zuckerberg um tries to usurp the usage of the word metaverse or not um the residents in second life go on um and uh continue to to live that part of their lives there so um in that sense it's it's been interesting to watch now on the other hand we all are reading about it constantly and so what it's doing is i think from from our perspective is it's leading us to think very carefully about what we're investing in when it comes to investing in different parts of second life and um to philip's point how do we withstand the onslaught if you will of all these other worlds that are being built um, with either a cryptocurrency or an advertising model which will then be able to offer experiences um, for free uh, that in our world need to be covered but that business model is critical so philip hinted at it um, when he was talking about the dangers of surveillance and modification as it becomes more specific if you look at other worlds other virtual worlds as competitors if your competitor can offer what you can offer for free and you have to charge that's a concerning position to be in um, but we're going to stick to our guns on this one and um, we're not going to uh, subject ourselves to the temptation of direct advertising or of advertising. What I think we're going to do and how it's going to impact us as a company and the residents, what we're going to do is we're going to continue to focus on experiences and bringing experiences and um, uh, social groups that have already been formed and see how we can bring them into Second Life and create uh, a more rich experience for current and perhaps um, use that model as a way to bring in new residents. We, we come, the team, and when I say we, I mean the whole company, um, and I, I'm certainly, I'm not using the royal we, it's, it's really not me. We have a thing called TUSOL, the Office of Second Life. Um, and just to, just to tell you how interesting the business is, so the Office of Second Life is not one person, it's four people. And that's who runs Second Life. So there's lots of checks and balances, and there's no CEO of Second Life. Um, and so, you know, it really is run by the residents and by uh, the the company, the, the 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 four people who make up the office of Second Life. And what I think that they are really leaning into is how do we bring from the outside world, from outside the world, perhaps these very rich experiences in because there are things that we can't build currently no resident can currently build that perhaps we can build um, with our own resources and i think that's what we're, and, and and the interest in the metaverse to try to bring this full circle um uh, philip can talk for 90 minutes straight um i do talk for 90 minutes straight accidentally so i'm sorry but um <laughs> the the thing that the interest uh, he has good ideas um the thing that the interest in the metaverse has done is it's gotten everybody else thinking about it and that is allowing us to pick and choose which companies we want to potentially work with in terms of building experiences and what i mean by that is i will make something up so i don't pick pick on something that may or may not be coming but let's say there's a there's a, a singer named alligator um, you know that singer may want their music um to get around and that's why they go to radio stations and they do interviews well they may we may want to bring that singer into second life 
not to do a concert, but perhaps to have a conversation. Um, we may bring that in as a um, as a as a music video, but but what we want to do is we want to do it in terms of bringing more experiences to the residents. If, for example, Alligator wanted to buy something in Second Life, that would be up to Alligator. Like we can't stop someone from buying land. We don't. We don't mm -hmm. go out and market our land. We're not to central land in that way. So it's it's a tightrope. We have to figure out how to bring more and more experiences. But three years ago, Alligator wasn't thinking about the metaverse, and now Alligator is thinking about the metaverse, and that's going to bring that's going to give us the opportunities to bring more experiences to the residents. Right. Yes. I I was going to say that Second Life has really been the only long-term successful virtual world. What would you see as important to that? I mean, you know, they've they've come, they've gone. Blue Mars, um, the one that was all little bubbles that was on Facebook. I can't remember its name even. <laughs> um, and Sony Home, they've all gone. What would you see as important yeah. to Second Life's um, well, sustainability? Is it the residents? Is it the creators who are residents? Is it something else? Well, it's certainly, first of all, it's fundamentally the orientation toward enabling the, the creation of content together, like we talked about earlier. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think the funny observation is that when 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 Second Life started and we began to grow quickly um and, and and therefore lots of people saw us and tried it out mm. and you know had been in world there was a kind of a very common thing which was to say hey the, the, you know this second life it's cool it's showing us all the ideas but what's really broken is you know x and 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 often they would say and the reason of this the reason for this thing not being right is because those people at linden lab are hackers they're not experienced designers they don't know how to build like ui you know and why why as soon as serious uh product designers get wind of this you know they're going to fix all these things and everybody in the world is going to be using uh, mm -hmm. a competitor to second life and then over the next it, and of course that, that was kind of painful sometimes i mean people would you know sort of send me emails to that extent you know saying you guys are yeah brutish hackers who know nothing of elegant interface design and you know i'd be like well you kind of do have a point there you know the the original 10 of us or so were we're very much you know working in the plumbing layer of enabling a virtual world right we we weren't yeah. it, it is it is a very fair it's a very fair critique uh and still fair today i think that we were enabling the you know, low level systems, moderation, uh, physics, economy, you know, all these things mm -hmm. that we had to mm -hmm. kind of get turned on for, for this whole thing to work. Um, but what happened in the years after, you know, we kind of got famous and people were levying these, these observations was that a half a billion dollars or so in venture capital was spent on, as you just alluded to, Safia, you know, like numerous competitors to Second Life mm -hmm. and none of them succeeded as you said um and in fact today as we know all of the social metaversey uh product usage that's driving a lot of the you know this is a big opportunity you know 20 million people saw travis scott uh you know in fortnite a lot of that is talking about the behavior of seven to 14 year old kids you know which, yeah. which is my minecraft roblox and fortnite um mm -hmm. it, as you said, and I'm so proud of this, I think Second Life is still, you know, the largest place for grown-up human beings to come together and experience an online social experience. Um, you know, there are new things like VR chat that are awesome and fascinating. Um, but, you know, there's still, there's, there's nothing that has anywhere near the, uh, you know, hundreds of millions or billions of people in, you know, daily that we have to get to for the metaverse to take on the kind of value that say facebook expects it, it will it will need to for their hail mary pass to land there so um it was interesting that all of that experimentation didn't 
kind of fix these what seems to be so obvious you know design problems so mm-hmm. the one observation i would simply have is that there is a magical kind of mystery to uh how to get grown-ups into online spaces in large numbers and it continues to be a difficult problem by the way covid and facebook and even the hmd uh didn't fix those problems um they they didn't you know make it feasible uh, you know to get billions of people into virtual worlds not yet um and i think that we are still the the best thinkers and experimenters around how to do that and there are still a lot of uh technical and uh governance and you know uh management you know hurdles to get over to to actually see that happen and and uh mm-hmm. I think it will happen. We're we're going to see. We're, well, secondly, I've seen a lot of growth uh, in the last few years, and I think we're going to continue to see a lot of growth overall. But it is going to be a a longer, less obvious road than what um, you know some of the kind of pundits and and Facebook would would have you think. Hmm. What are the things that worry you most? Uh, what steps are you taking to ensure that Second Life? remains the better metaverse. Well, hmm. yeah, so, you know, kind of tying it into Philip's previous answer, I, I'm, I'm, I'm betting that well over a billion dollars has been invested in competing, if you will, virtual worlds, um, that then have leaned into financial models and business models that that are not good for the whole world in general virtual second life has paid out over a billion dollars over its life right and that's it that's a very big that's a that's a fairly significant difference in statistic right so um certainly roadblocks is starting to pay out creators and there are other there are other fringe companies but really second life has paid out a tremendous amount of money to creators and so if there's a risk it's that some of these other worlds that are based on advertising um are able to entice our creators away and then the experience might reduce the, the primary experience is social in second life and so that wouldn't change but we are we as the owners of the company do have to be on the lookout for competitive situations because it's a fragile world and if half the creators leave there there would be a problem if if a quarter of the if the quarter of the residents go to another virtual world that's that's not going to be good for for second life. So the flip side of that is the hope that as people get involved in other virtual worlds, they will come to recognize that second life is the best one to commit to. Um, I don't see in the short term a situation where you're going to spend equal time in six virtual worlds. Um, And so Hopefully that gets out. We don't market Second Life. We don't advertise on Google um, uh, anymore. We are just building the best thing that we can build. And hopefully, we. I think that the more residents that come in, the richer the experience, the more engagement, the happier the residents are, which by the way, our, our, our objectives in the company is, um, uh more residents um more engaged residents um happy residents and happy lindens we call the employees lindens and happy lindens and those are our four um pillars (laughs) and so um that we talk about in company meetings and things like that so i hope that it works out is is really it's it's a lot more hope than despair but i do you you asked a specific question Competition, offering what we offer for free um, with advertising is, it's an existential risk that, um, that we hope to uh, 
that we hope to to combat with a, just a, a great and more rich experience. I'd give a kind of a maybe a more philosophical answer, which is that the very fact that Second Life has this unusual quality that its design, its 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 implementation of different features and capabilities has been directly in support of people creating things in the world and you know in some cases making money from them um second life is so unusual in that almost every sort of feature or aspect of it as a as a system and as a piece of software is to enable things to be created you know as brad said and you know obviously people have made made things in second life for many many different reasons one of those sometimes for some of the people has been to make money and like brad said you know, people have made at this point a billion dollars in second life which is just a re it's just a really a large amount of money for for a phenomena that's still relatively young um and what goes along with that is that there is this unbelievable right there's a couple of billion objects that are on the ground as i always like to say in second life you know at any mm -hmm. moment and any change that we make to second life runs the risk of um uh breaking some of that content and so one of the things that i see as being this interesting philosophical and uh kind of strategic problem that second life has is that we've made something which is full of all these rich features which are then used together in very very sophisticated ways to make money for some people or to make art or to make content or to make places for their friends you know um, if we make changes to that system, say to respond to emerging technology, you know, like the head mounted display or heavier use of voice or anything, whatever, we can't do that without, you know, risking um, uh, affecting the ability for the, this existing immense amount of people and objects to kind of keep working. So I think we have an unusual. Uh, it's an it's unusually difficult to change Second Life, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. You know, like it like people talk about democracy being useful to some extent because it moves slowly. You know, it kind of keeps mm. terrible things from happening overly quickly. You know, that's one of the many benefits of democracy. I think, like Brad said, the four people that run. That, that, that serve as the you know the executive team of Second Life, the strategies that we've made, this this dependency on literally billions of dollars of content that people have built means that we can't be as agile in responding to you know new technology um, mm -hmm. a, 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 as everybody else. And I think that is a problem that is not a sometimes people say, well, you know that's just because you're using this or that programming language nonsense. It's a problem that is intrinsic to the idea of creating a living world in which people can build things and then mm -hmm. keeping that running okay um while still having our eyes open and like brad said you know if, if if facebook manages to do something that has a material number of people in it then we have to look at that and say as brad said you know if 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 there's a a cre you know if, if people are gradually migrating into that new space we we all, we, we will all lose together <laughs> you know we have to right. somehow adapt to that so I, I think that's the uh, not an easy problem, but if you ask, you know, what do you worry about? You know, there it is, you know, that the, the very success of Second Life has made it um, very, very difficult to change. Yeah, yeah. I've seen some of the things that happen when slight adjustments are made and there's just no realization right. that they actually underpin a whole different area of the grid and suddenly people are screaming because something doesn't work anymore there are it, many wonderful stories of his from history of bugs that we had right where yeah. we just had something broken like a a triangle turned backwards on a box or something and then <laughs> people would start using that bug to make something like see through you know bones i remember the one where you could see inside avatars and they had skeletons and stuff you could you could literally put content inside the avatar but then i don't even remember what the trick was there was a trick where you could basically make the avatar transparent and see its guts and then that was a bug and then we fixed that bug and nobody could see the nobody could see through the you know skeleton avatars anymore so there are just so many things like that in here that um yeah. i've grown more and more respectful of i suppose over these last 20 years 
Kate, now we've mentioned a little about Tilia, and I would like to add a little more and say what what does the community need to know about Tilia and how that helps Second Life grow? And this is a question that I really am interested in. Is it in a way a cryptocurrency, although not traded in the way that blockchain cryptos are? So let me answer those two questions. So Second Life can't operate without Tilia, not because of a technical relationship, but because the fact that when you, just like if you use PayPal, when you move money from one individual to another, um, that, is, that is regulated and you must rely on a company that is constantly audited um, to make sure that it happens um, in a way that is commensurate with the laws and regulations of the country you're working in. Right. That's a very important thing, just to know that, um, you know, the system works, uh, the system is checked out a lot, um, mm. you know, never say never on things, but we spend a lot of time making that system very robust. The second question was, is it a cryptocurrency? And I guess Philip would be better to answer that in the sense that by definition, a cryptocurrency is on the blockchain. But if you take that away from the definition, mm. then I would say, sure, you can you could call it a cryptocurrency. It was certainly the first in that way. It just doesn't mm. sit on a blockchain. The difference is, and it's a very important difference, is that the Linden dollar is a closed system that has two open ends on it meaning you can take let's call it we call it fiat so you can take fiat currency which is a dollar or a euro and you mm -hmm. can turn it into a linden dollar and you right. can take a linden dollar and you can turn it into fiat that's mm -hmm. true and in that sense it's open but the actual trading of it and the value is kept inside of second life why is that important in all these other versions where they are actual cryptocurrencies that cryptocurrency as you pointed out can trade on coinbase and we believe that that is a real problem and because once you're creating a world where the currency to make the world work becomes a vehicle for you to profit just off of the fact that you own some of it the whole economy breaks down. If you own a hundred dollars worth of Linden dollars and tomorrow it's worth 105 and the next day it's worth 120, that sounds good for you, but you don't spend the money. Mm. And if the Linden dollar, if the, if the value is crashing 10% a day, you don't accept the money. So it, it actually, it may sound good, but it actually ruins the economy. Um, and so we've really, we, we've really put a hard no on turning the Linden dollar into a cryptocurrency. But I think Philip probably has right. a, a, a little different take on it. Mine's probably too. No, I mean, that's great. Let me expand on that. When, when we started, so the thing that's so fascinating, as I said earlier about Second Life as a cryptocurrency. So I think in many ways, second, the Linden dollar, uh, you know, has very similar, uh, is a very interesting cousin of cryptocurrencies because it is, um, you know, it's its own, currency so it's like a coin in that sense right mm. it it is it, it it is traded um openly uh you know against other currencies you know against the dollar and, and oh and by the way uh against the bitcoin as well i'll come back to that but um the the, the difference with the linden dollar was that we from so uh when people talk about money, an overly simplified way to talk about money, but nevertheless useful, is that it it serves two purposes which are very, very different. The first purpose is as a means of trade. So the whole point of money, right, is that you don't want to carry your pigs and your, you know, uh, bushels of wheat to the market when you need a light bulb. Um, 
you know, right. that's very inconvenient because the market you're going to might not need pigs at that moment, right? The place yeah. that sells light bulbs. So that's the meaning of, that's the use of money to enable trade, basically. So money is a, you know, almost a social contract that enables specialization in trade. That's, that's thing number one about money. Number two is as a store of value. Meaning if I sell a million dollar house, I can get a million dollars of money then I can hide that in a vault or something. And then at some point later, I can get it out again and buy another house worth a million dollars. That's the idea of a store of value, okay? So there's means right. of trade and store of value. As Brad was saying, the excitement around crypto has been on the store of value side because people have said, oh my God, what if we made this scarce number of Bitcoins that could never be changed because it was simulated on a many, many people's computers, blah, blah, blah then you'd get this very interesting store of value thing going on where people would uh you, you know could sort of park money in bitcoins and see if they mm -hmm. go up but as brad said that direct the store of value use case where the currency is going up in value means that it's useless as a means of trade because only a fool would buy gasoline or milk or something with a currency that is going up 10 percent a month or something you know it'd be dumb what you want to do instead is you know use a currency that's not going up on day one when we started second life i wanted to distribute resources fairly amongst people because of course people were going to be building in this vast space together right and we sat down and said now how are we going to fairly parcel out the compute resources the prims the mm. the land whatever right and so we immediately said well we'll just we, we just need to build some kind of a digital currency that will enable that and so that from day one was what we had to do and because of that we had this concern which brad alluded to that was we were like well wait a second if we do this in a way where the price of the currency goes up on the open market we'll completely screw ourselves we nobody mm. will be able to use it to buy and sell stuff for their avatars um, and so we can't do that. And so we had to devise a monetary policy, as they call it, which would which would hopefully keep the price of the linen dollar from going up. And that is exactly what we did. And uh, that began a kind of a, 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 gra a grand experiment, you know, which has been going on mm -hmm. for 20 years successfully, 19, I guess we say this year or this yeah. very week. Um, you know, we, we had to design something that would allow people to uh, trust the stability of the currency while embracing some of the other ideas that were exciting about cryptocurrency. So we, we we did this radical thing where we didn't have a scarce number of Linden dollars. We actually did increase the number in circulation over time, and that enabled people to use it as a, quote, you know, normal uh, currency that they could use for trade. And we succeeded mm. in doing that, which was so super cool. And Tilia, in part, is, as Brad described, a result of all of the legal and regulatory work we had to do and work around fraud and work around consumer protection, all these things we had to do to actually deliver on that idea of you can have a virtual currency that you can use to buy and sell stuff in the world, but then you can purchase it with dollars and then you can trade it back out to euros and it, it all just works. And so we had to do a ton of work as a business to make that work. And now we've made that into a subsidiary of the company that can sell that capability to other companies as well as providing it for Second Life. How is that going? The um, are other companies interested in using Tilia? Sorry, are the are other company? Did you say are other companies? Other interested? companies, yes. Yes, because that's so, the idea that they can. So because what Tilia built is so robust, um, other virtual worlds who want to um, enable creators to make money um, uh, are using Tilia as their financial rails, we call them, the literally like train tracks. Um, moving money, uh, you call it rails. And so moving money from one person to the other, they are using our financial rails. Um, mm -hmm. They're very happy with it. And uh, it's really good because we um, we think it's we think it's good for the business, the Linden business, um, uh, which is good for everyone, Second Life, residents, me. 
um, other uh, employees. Um, and uh, and it's also very exciting. You asked, you know, some of the things that I'm excited about. It's also a very exciting. It's it's so new and it's so, uh, you know, just no one's really thought about this in that way. Um, to me, it's as equally exciting as crypto. It just has a longer, um, uh, it has it has more opportunity and less damage. Um, but it's but creating currencies for virtual worlds is is very exciting. And I and I do think it's a real it's a real um, reason why Second Life is so successful. And I'm always in awe that um, Philip came up with this uh, way back when, before anyone was even mm -hmm. thinking about it. So. Um, some of the most, some of the, some of the really well-known folks, and then there's there's other components um, of Tilia that are really powerful that we're helping um, other gaming engines and things like that. Great. I was thinking of the years you've tried. Um, sorry, hang on, I'm going to cough. <coughs> sorry about that. I was thinking of the, the years you've actually tried various ways of balancing the economy and there's i think back in the early days there was something called a prim tax and then <laughs> there's been the cost of land the use of marketplace fees from creators for marketplace there have been quite a lot of experiments haven't there over the years balancing the economy there certainly have you mentioned prim taxes. I think that's great. That's a great example of how um, complicated all this stuff is, and perhaps even how early we still are in the emergence of the metaverse. Um, the the thing we did at the very beginning that there was the funny uh, tax revolt around was mm -hmm. that what I wanted to do was make it so that the um, the the fees associated with having con like with having like a piece of land and then having stuff on that land on that parcel were as closely as possible related to the actual use of the server computer that you were on, right? So for example, right. if you had a light, uh, if you had a light on the property, that that costs everybody something because of the computations associated with that and the rendering, right? right. Um, if you, you know, if you had big textures, you know, all these ideas. And so at the beginning, because i was trying to make it as again as fair as possible so people you know were fairly out we were fairly allocating the resources relative to people's investment or whatever um we had these uh, we had this tax system that was very very complex so you know you'd move a you'd move a lamp across your room and your taxes would change and your taxes were <laughs> levied like weekly and so there was this very well deserved you know tax revolt where of course in true second life style everybody realized oh my gosh this looks like the tea party or something and we're going to have this tax you know revolt it was fantastic and um uh yeah yeah that was an example of where I, I would defend that I was actually trying to do the right thing because mm -hmm. as a resident today, sometimes you might be frustrated, you know, because your, your neighbor has too many people over at their party. Right. And then n nobody can come to your parcel. That that's kind of an outgrowth of the way we changed things, uh, after that tax report because we couldn't just charge everybody kind of instantaneously what the servers were using. We were ahead of our time though. You know, that's basically how you buy services from amazon today for example for you know compute services you know you you pay for what you use <laughs> and i i actually think you know the, the the better way in some sense and maybe the not the future way for second life but you know the the way things will ultimately have to get is that when you build virtual worlds you know you, you you're, you're kind of paying for the resources you consume so yes that was a that's a great historic example among along with many of weird and wonderful things that we tried and changed and learned from and, i guess the and other big picture there later, is just a lot of work you know it's a lot of work yeah. and mm -hmm. 10 years later we're still uh grappling with uh with that problem right unfortunately servers cost money and building the technology and maintaining cost money um but with what philip did back then and tried to do now it's easier to do with aws if the cost of a server exactly matched the value that was extracted by using that server this would mm. be quite easy the tension of course is that 
there's some parts of Second Life that cost a lot in terms of using server power. So they cost us a lot of money, but they don't provide particularly incredible value. So charging a whole bunch for something that doesn't have value to a resident, it's not going to work long term. And so Mm -hmm. what we are trying to do to avoid, but, but then again, the business model of taxation, either through land um, charges or through a marketplace, that, that is a very good business model um, because it's a lot better than, than accepting advertising to manipulate the situation and to surveillance people. Um, So, so we have to constantly guide through that tension Um, Switching over to AWS, A, let us do a lot more services to folks and made the experience a lot richer in terms of our ability to handle spikes. Um, And it also is allowing us to look at more detail in terms of server usage. And so we're probably going to come out again with products that only create more value than they cost. We will probably be coming out with, quote unquote, more expensive land, but that gives people a lot more value if they want it, no one's going to be forced into it, but we will offer things that can handle a lot more computing power that will cost us a lot more money. And then if the resident wants to do it, if a, if a group of residents want to do it, if, a, if, um, if it's for a short period of time, we're going to try to solve all those problems to give, to give that uh, optionality um, to the residents. An important note, and I actually asked the team it this week, it's funny. So if you look at the Apple store and you're a creator, Apple takes the first 30 cents of every dollar. If you look at Rob, if you look at Roblox and you buy something through the Apple store, Apple takes the first 30 cents, Roblox takes the next 35 cents. And so in general, in the marketplace, a creator makes somewhere between 25, 35, in that neighborhood, you know, 30% call it and 70%. That's the market. Right. In Second Life, we charge none person to person, um, resident to resident. We charge 10% on the marketplace in total. And you can spend an awful lot of time in Second Life and spend no money. And so yeah. I, I asked the team, I said, do our residents know how good a deal <laughs> that is versus the rest of the world. And, it, and the answer was yes, but don't try to change it. And I, and I loved the answer, right? <laughs> like, okay, so here we are, we're, we're anywhere from a, a third to 70% cheap, less expensive. Um, and really we charge the way we look at it, we basically charge 1%, right? Because not a lot of transactions are on the marketplace. Um, we effectively charge 1% of all transactions. Um, to the residents, and we're compared against 30 to 70. So we're 70x cheaper than Roblox. And what I want is I want then the creators at Roblox to be like, wow, that's mm-hmm. a lot better. I should be building stuff in Second Life. Um, and maybe Roblox is a bad example given their age range. But, but so you ask that, that's a tension that we're going to, we're just going to be very careful about solving as our costs go up or if our costs go up, how do we solve that problem? Um, mm-hmm. The good news is I'm really happy when I find out that, you know, 90 to 99% of the dollars um, spent in world are, uh, you know, we're charging a percentage, 1%. Now we do charge to accept the, the Linden dollar to come in and we have to charge for the Linden dollar to get turned into cash on the way out because that costs us specific money. Like we have to pay credit card fees and things like that. But in general, um, that's the way, that's what those taxes, like you, we have to pay for the servers somehow. Um, so that's, that's. Um, there's, a, there's another little story about economics that relates to what we talked about earlier, which is this difference between supporting communities that live together and create things together in a virtual world, which is Second Life versus like selling people things with, a virtual world kind of being the latest endpoint for the suckers to come and you know buy waste money on stuff right um fees on transactions 
are in a very interesting and complicated way, very related to that as, as Brad was touching on. If you are selling, um, you know, concert t-shirts for a music event or something in a virtual world and people come in and they basically are buying from the famous artists that had the concert, a t-shirt that's 20 bucks, right? When you buy that $20 t-shirt, if, um, if you spend that $20 and say two, two or $3 of that 20 goes to like the credit card processor, who cares? The, the giant company that made the t-shirt or, you know, the band or whatever gets $18 and who cares? You know, you, you paid a couple of bucks in fees, right? And it's like, Brad's mm -hmm. talking about this with these, uh, like, like on the Apple store, it's 30% and on steam it's something like that right it's like 30 percent for you know yeah. things people sell on there but now let's consider a very much more second life like situation and here's here 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 here, here goes that brad and i live next to each other in uh in linden homes in second life okay mm -hmm. we're both creative but in different ways um we start with twenty dollars okay? okay i go i go over on day one on monday and brad um, sings me a song. He's an amazing singer. You didn't know this. And he sings me a song and I give him the $20 and he takes the $20. The next day on Tuesday, Brad needs a, he wants to, uh, he wants his, uh, uh, kid to take a math class and see. So he goes over to his friend, Philip, who's the avatar next door, who he knows to have a lot of experience with math. And he asks Philip teach a math lesson to his kids for an hour for which Philip charges, you guessed it, $20. Mm -hmm. Brad then gives the $20 back to Philip, and we're basically kind of back at square one. <laughs> the yes. next day, I want another song, and I go to Brad, and I give him the 20 back, and then the next day, he wants another math class, and so he comes back over. In this way, the $20 circulates between us indefinitely. Right. And so we can have a community inside. And of course, you can imagine what I'm trying to say here. There could be a hundred people involved in that, which is typically referred to as a circular economy nowadays. Um, and that $20 sort of circulates around very quickly. And because we can give it to each other freely in the world, we can basically all just get by, basically sharing things with each other, all using that $20, except you know what I'm going to say. What if, what if the first time I paid Brad for the song, he only got 18? Then the next day when he, because two went to MasterCard and then the next day he comes back, I only get 16 because two right. went to MasterCard. And then the third day, and you can see by about the end of the week, we're done. <laughs> Neither yes. of us has any more money. We're poor. We don't have any Linden dollars to trade with. So this is a, I hope entertaining example of how, uh, one of the examples of how economies are really important and enabling them is sensitive to the kind of situation that you're trying to create. And in mm -hmm. particular, if you're trying to create a community that's self-supporting, where people are trading with each other, you need to have the option of having either very low fees or zero, as we do. Um, if you are enabling a pass-through economy where you're mostly just advertising things to people and then selling it to them, the, mm -hmm. the fees really don't matter because the the water of the economy, if you will, is just kind of flowing one way and then exiting out again. It's not moving around internally. I don't know if that's fun to listen to, but it's an example of well, how deeply we think about this stuff and, you know, how, and it's also an example of how um, the uh, high fees based economies won't work. They'll, they'll just die because there's not an ability to do that internal trade. You just run out of money very quickly. I will add one thing. I'm not sure Philip realized you do know, Philip, that in your example, you were um, working for a song. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Very cool. That's great. Now, That's great. I, you may have wondered why I've um, added a rather large troll to the stage. Who wouldn't? And uh, his name is Hugh. And uh, he was actually um, something I bought as a unique item as a fantasy fair auction and i thought it's a good illustration of the recent phenomenon phenomenon of non-fungible tokens unique digital goods that can be owned because i certainly own you and 
It's just the artist and me who have copies of him. Um, yeah. He's got a unique ID. And he wasn't cheap, but he was hugely cheaper than what people are paying for NFTs outside Second Life. Uh, do you think there's a future for NFTs, especially, well, you know, perhaps in Second Life? You know, NFTs, just as you say, mm -hmm. and I, I'm right clicking on Mr. Troll right now. And so I can mm -hmm. I can tell us all various secret facts about this troll for example he was created by beck janis mm. um and of course he is currently owned safia by you um he's part of a uh, uh he's part of, he's part of a group second life birthday and as you said he has a specific name he's not for sale um and um but if he were for sale the next owner would be able to modify and copy him um these properties this metadata associated with digital objects has been one of the key um features that we built into second life from the very beginning and in my opinion and i, I think most everybody would agree with me this is one of the things that has made second life so successful is the ability that we have to right click on things and see what their properties are and if they're for sale and of course that has risen its head again in modern times with the name nf T or non-fungible token, but it's exactly the same thing. So um, basically every atom in Second Life, every primitive has this same data on it and is, is essentially an NFT in modern parlance. Um, of, of course, Second Life is a lot easier because the, this data doesn't, it doesn't cost money to uh, move these objects around. That was what we just touched on before. Again, if, if Brad and I were passing this troll back and forth as our means of, uh, <laughs> of paying each other for things. And there was a $40 fee each time we moved the troll back and forth, which is what happens if you use a blockchain today. Um, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do that very successfully, uh, you know, as a means of getting by. Um, but yeah, the, the, the basic concept of having, um, digital information that is uh, immovable and attached to each of the digital assets in the world is one of the things that made Second Life successful. And so, you know, of course, we find it utterly unsurprising that, you know, the world has gotten so excited about NFTs now. So if you're if you're asking, though, Safia, about, you know, should we put NFTs um, in, in the blockchain sense or something into Second Life? Um, well, we certainly could. I mean, I dare say somebody has probably written a script <laughs> this very day. I would, it, were we on text chat here, I, I bet you anything that there'd be probably multiple people that would call in, if you will, right now and say, yeah. I've already written a script in the LSL that basically loads <laughs> NFTs from OpenSea and visualizes them in world. I, I'm going to just wave my hands and say, I am, I will bet you just about anything that such a thing already exists in Second Life. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think NFTs are a natural kind of conjunction with Second Life. As to the company kind of fundamentally supporting them, well, I mean, it, it, we, we've, we've already sort of done even better with, with, with the system that we have. Now, I, I think philosophically people would say, but, but um, that's not decentralized fully in the sense that Linden Lab um, is still the kind of data store you know, for those, uh, for, for those NFTs, if you will, for the prims, mm -hmm. um, I would retort with, well, there are pros and cons to not having any uh, intermediary in which to place uh, trust or to ask to do things. And of course, anyone who is an artist in Second Life will tell you that there is, you know, great complexity around uh, completely decentralized marketplaces, because in many cases, they allow the theft of intellectual property as effectively mm. as they allow trading and everything else. And so um, I think that, you know, that's one of the reasons that NFTs have been such a, uh, one of the many reasons that they've been such a, oh, what would you say, you know, a, a, a hot spot for public debate around this stuff. But the yeah. best of the NFT is what's already in uh, every single object in Second Life. And so I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy about that. Including a basic cube. Exactly. It all starts with a. It all starts with a cube. 
and a plywood cube at that. You know, it, by the way, I mean, the other thing that you can't see over the history of Second Life, you can, only, you can only see the final version that we're sitting in here on stage, is just, I think, one of the most amazing things to get to watch as a human being ever was the, the increase in the quality and in, in the remarkableness, you know, in the, in the artistic detail and stuff of what people were building in Second Life. It was so fun. Like, I had to trust that that was going to happen. And we, we would have these, like, game designers and stuff who would come in in the like earliest months of second life and they'd be like it's just a gigantic squalor of plywood cubes it's horrible you know some of them with colors this is just awful you know mm -hmm. and i would just say just wait just hold yeah. on just hold your breath hold your breath and and everybody would be, i don't believe it you know this is terrible you've got a bunch of you know increasingly weird rotated you know twisted plywood cubes here and we waited and we waited and we waited and sure enough you know that kind of exponential curve of creativity started and you know the rest is history so that yeah. was pretty fun to watch i was going to ask about something in a a non-technical way which is um what i think is sometimes called technical debt that's when a project is created developed launched and still has holes in it. There are several examples in Second Life. Uh, one example I was given was Animesh. For example, we have some awesome creatures, horses, dragons, and so on. But something like curtains that can be open and closed, which is something that residents would love, can't be easily done at the moment. It would need a fix. Are you going to have do you have, will you have, a policy of looking back at these development holes in projects? One one statement is I think I, I think that our very own uh, Mojo and Grumpity are going to take this topic on more richly um, in, mm -hmm. in a couple of days or so, which is awesome. Um, at at these events, the uh, one thing I would say though is that. That concept of technical debt is very closely related to what we touched on earlier. What I touched on as the concern that um, th the world has such a rich set of capabilities, which is what's required to create content. And then once you have that, you can't, it's very difficult to change those fundamental features and capabilities. So that idea of technical debt, which is more traditionally just the, when you started working on something a long time ago, you end up with a lot of lines of code that are then later on difficult to change or work on is kind of like uh, multiplied in a system like Second Life and few others by this fact that every single one of those capabilities is used to build things that are then present in the world. And so you've got to be extraordinarily careful about making changes to the system. So I would defend that in addition to the commentary and worth, you know, very worthy conversation about technical debt that we'll hear uh, soon from the team, I would even add to that that you've got this additional problem that it is multiplied by having to keep all this content working. Right. Where would you like to see Second Life go in the future? You know, where would you like it to be in five years' time? Probably, you know, dancing on the remains of other virtual worlds that have failed to take off. <laughs> or am i being too harsh there well i'd i'd wrap up by going you know going all the way back to the beginning and saying that second life has been such a i i think not just for me but for others has been such an inspiration during such a hard time um you know on, on so many levels but I, I would say that one of them is this idea that you can use communication technology to bring people together that's what we've done here and the only thing that i'd like to see is for it to be something that more people can experience because you know the ability of second life to get people who as i said before you know say in the real world might not have liked each other or might have had different politics or something to come together and find common ground and get to like each other. I mean, that's something that the world really needs right now. So I hope, I would wish that whether it is changes to Second Life or even other 
companies or or products in in the industry or these ecosystems following our lead i think that i would like to see virtual worlds used more for that kind of togetherness to bring people together and get them uh get them closer to each other without needing to be face to face Brad, what about you one of the many things that i admire and love about virtual worlds second life in particular is how incredibly equalizing they are um, across so many um, features of human beings uh, yeah. out there so um, in second life unless you choose to disclose it uh, we really don't know who you are we don't know your gender your race your religion um your age and there's a beauty to that that you know i i do know that sometimes i come back to commerce a lot but again we we do have to pay for the servers but there's a beauty so 80 percent of our top earners are women yeah that is a beautiful thing as an example. It's a beautiful thing in itself, but it's a beautiful thing as an example for the rest of the world. When everyone is equal, those that have the best offering, work the hardest, work the smartest, whatever it is, can provide for themselves in ways that in the physical world, it's just not possible. Mm -hmm. There just is not the same opportunity in the physical world for people to increase their, particularly monetary, but increase their social economic status as easy as it is to do in the virtual world. So you ask five years for many of the same reasons. I think that if personally, Lyndon, personally me, Lyndon and all the Lyndons, Second Life and all the residents, if we can be part of something that really, I really believe can make the world a better place, that's a really valiant purpose and mission. Yes, I and I think it's possible. And I think it's and I think it's I think it's likely mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. My my optimism is very high on this example of building equality around the globe and i think that that's a very powerful vision and i think it's an extension of philip's vision it is not coming from me um, and so if i can actualize half of the things that philip thought in his head over the past 19 years and that Tussle is working on right now, if I can make half those things realities, I'll feel very good about where we are in five years. That's terrific. I'm going to ask a question um, on a lighter note, which is what's craziest, most bizarre thing you've seen or done in second life that's my answer i just want to laugh I, <laughs> good grief that's like one of those questions people would ask me and i like people would say i i love there was a question people would ask, what surprised you about second life and i look at them and i'd be like are you really asking me that like I intentionally built something designed to be very surprising. You know what I mean? Like most surprised. everything, that was yes. the whole darn point of it, you know? But um, yeah. <laughs> so crazy would be the same thing. My gosh, I'm looking back on 20 years of experiences. I don't, I don't even know where I, I don't even know where I'd get started. I, I, I always retell cause it's just, it's just a crowd pleaser, but it's, you know, one of the, well, I'll retell this cause I'm so old and I, and I remember second life at the very beginning. Um, Oh gosh, I'm trying to think if I could pick a different one, but you know, when we, when we first opened the world and 
the people were coming in at the very beginning. This, this is just after Linden World and when Second Life actually started, I think. So this is into summer like Natoma. Um, and we had a little tiny, like, it looked like one of those corrals where you b break horses or whatever, you know, it was mm -hmm. like a small circular, what paddock or what you'd call it. And the new, pe <laughs> new people would show up right there. And the, the people that were in the world already it would sit on the edge of that fence and the new people would show up and then they'd say you know hello welcome to second life you know and so that was like the original welcome area experience but there was this one of the things that broke us out kind of into the public eye was was this guy who turned himself into a real uh you know legit area 51 alien now th bear in mind this is right at the beginning so right. we didn't have um the feature set was quite different and one of the things that was key to this guy's experiences experience that he created was that you could apply forces to an avatar at a distance with a script now as we all know you can't do that anymore but that right. was uh doable back then and so what he would do is he would hover over this welcome area where people were showing up and of course it, with a third person camera people didn't usually look uh, straight up Right. right you know when they were coming in and he would turn on the classic you know cow lifting uh ale and he was in a he was in a you know disc alien spaceship and he'd turn on the beam would come down once in a while on one of these new people and then to the to the shock of the people sitting around by on the fence the the, the hapless new resident would be lifted up through the beam into the alien spaceship and then he would shut the door they could see him driving and but by the way this is you didn't have chairs so he, yeah. they'd basically be rattling around in the spaceship they they weren't actually sitting and he would drive off with the person like what are where am i what's going on so he would abduct them this alien would abduct you and then he would drive off to like the weirdest place he could find and then he would open the door and just drop you out of the spaceship into it and take off never never having said anything and <laughs> <laughs> this happened to somebody and they i think it was wired magazine or it was some big news and basically the article the story was i was abducted by aliens in the virtual world of second life and that was one of the things that um really put us on the map in the start and so that story i never get tired of retelling that because i i think i saw it happen or i sat there and waited for the guy and was just like that is ridiculous ridiculous um presumably hundreds of people then rushed in to try and get abducted. Exactly. And it was probably <laughs> hundreds or low thousands at that point. It was yeah. it was quite a bit uh uh yeah it was, it was a while ago. Yeah. So uh, it's a bit early but um but are you looking forward to seeing things at the birthday? absolutely i know it just opened now and i think we're uh yeah I'm, I'm looking forward to wandering around and and seeing it it's always it's always fun to see these celebrations happen in second life and it's pretty exciting i can't believe it's 19 years and my gosh tomorrow next year it'll be 20 that is just yeah my goodness my goodness what that it's says about my gray hair it? yeah yeah I can't see any at the moment. It all seems fairly red to me. Yeah, I've dyed it. I've I've kept coloring it um, on my avatar. Right. I kept it really nice, ruddy color all these years. Well, Brad and Philip, thank you both very much for giving sparing so much of your time to talk to me today. It's been sure. wonderful. Pleasure to be here. This has been great. Absolutely. Thank you so much.